So we'll go ahead and get started. And our very own Jessica Sayer, Hessen County Horticulture Agent, will be doing the program today. You guys know her as Miss Moderator that's been on all the programs, but she will be uh, teaching uh, this part of the program, which is home composting. Before we turn Jessica loose to get started with today's program, I uh, see that a lot of you guys already put your, have already put your name and county in the chat box. Please go ahead and do that. And as always, as you have questions, go ahead and type those in and we'll discuss the questions towards the end of the program. Uh, Jessica, do we need to discuss anything else before you get started? Um, I think we're good. Um, thanks for the intro and thank you everyone for joining us. I guess I will mention um, this is the last session in our schedule of series that we started back in January. Um, so thank you for those. Several of you have joined us all along or joined us on um, occasional times and we really appreciate that. If there's any sessions that you have missed, um, they have been recorded. They, um, if you had signed up for a session, um, you should have gotten an email once that recording was made available. But regardless, if you go to our websites, um, the extension website for Harrison, Bourbon, Franklin, and Woodford counties, and you go to the horticulture page, you should be able to locate the uh, recordings from each of those classes, just in case you missed one. So um, hopefully you were able to join us, but we know that's not always possible. So definitely um, check those out if you're, if you're interested. And if there's one that you can't find for some reason, just email one of us or give us a call and we can direct you. We can direct you to that. So Ray, are we good to go? I think we are Share my go. screen and make sure that you can see it. My computer's being super slow. It's getting there. Can you see the screen? Uh, sounds good. And it looks like you're sharing presenter view, Jessica. Okay. I don't know if you want to do that or not. I do not. I do not. Usually under the three little dots is my shortcut right there to the upper right of your mouse. Uh, I think you can take it out of presenter view right there is the new shortcut. Uh, just uh, underneath the hands on your slide. If you go over uh, to the right of that, there's three little dots. And oh. you can, I believe there is a high presenter view. Yes, there you go. Uh, one up. Thank you, Ray. I'm sorry. I should know how to do this by now. It happens. I do that every time and I have to hit the magic button. There we go. Perfect. Looks good, Jessica. We've got the, we, I've got the two screens going. And I know sometimes space yeah. like that too. And it sometimes it works just perfectly and sometimes it does. <laughs> oh, I know. I do that quite often. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, so I think we're good to go now with the screen sharing, so I appreciate it. Um, so like Ray had said, we're going to be talking about home composting. Um, not sure who in our crowd today already does this. Um, you might have, we probably have different experience levels, but if you have questions as we go along, just type those in the chat box and um, we will get, those, get to those um, at the end of the presentation. All right, so today what we're going to discuss is um, just the definition of composting, um, the benefits of it, how it actually works, what is needed and included to, for your composting to be successful, um, how to actually use the compost once it's ready, some different options for compost bins, and then some troubleshooting. So what is composting? Um, it is a tool that allows us to control and speed up the natural decomposition process of organic materials. So that is the definition. But basically, um, we're taking plant waste, um, vegetable waste, uh, grass clippings, things like that. And over time, we're going to put it into a compost pile of some sort. And we'll talk about options for that. But over time, that is going to decompose um, and it's going to turn into organic matter. And then if we decide to use that compost um, as an addition to our soil, things like that, then we can um, we can use that as organic matter. And it is then in a form that the plants can actually use for the nutrient value. 
So some benefits of composting, um, it's going to recycle materials that may have otherwise been thrown into a landfill, and we'll talk more about that as we go. Um, we're going to be able to reduce our yard waste um, potentially by 50 to 75 percent, depending on your specific situation. Um, compost, it can be used as a soil amendment, so it's not a fertilizer, but it can be used as a soil amendment, which is really great if you have um, heavy clay soils and things like that, that it's not the best growing material. Um, compost can be organic matter that is added that is going to really give your soil um, a, good, a good quality. And it increases earthworm activity, which is beneficial to plant growth and um, soil health. So most of the time, whenever we have a compost bin, especially for a horticulturalist, we are using that compost at the time for our garden, okay? After we are in the bin and it has been composted, it has been decomposed and it's ready to use. If you are using that material as organic matter to add to your garden or just to your, to your yard in a bare spot where you need to establish more grass or things like that, that compost can technically improve your soil. So that is one of the main benefits um, and the uses that I have used it for personally. So the way that it does that, compost can provide bacteria, fungi, other microorganisms and worms with, which would be in your soil and, and the good guys, okay? Um, with nutrients, energy, and a habitat that will stimulate them to break down organic residue which is what we wanted to do. We wanted to decompose, we wanted to break down. Um, it provides humus, which is an organic material that has been decomposed completely. And that is gonna help the soil, your existing soil, help it retain its nutrients, which is great. Um, improves aeration in clay soil. So I mentioned earlier, if you have a heavy clay soil, you are gonna to need to do something. It's not gonna be an overnight fix, but adding organic material and organic matter to your soil over time is going to improve that clay soil by helping the soil um, break down those thick clay particles um, and allow excess water to drain. Because with clay soils, a lot of times our water will just kind of sit there and that drainage is a problem. Um, the opposite of that, if you have sandy soils, which we don't really have a lot of here, but um, sandy soils, water just rushes right through. So um, adding organic matter, adding compost can help the roots actually absorb the water they need before um, shooting on through that sand. So how composting works. Um, we're going to be um, talking more in depth about each of these, but we have good gas in our soil. Okay, we've got Good, good microorganisms um, that are breaking down all of this matter that is going to become organic material. And the good guys, what they need, what they eat is carbon and nitrogen. So carbon is their carbohydrates. Carb I said that totally wrong, carbohydrates. Um, and we call that the brown stuff. And you're gonna see a chart of that in just a moment. And then um, they also eat nitrogen, which is their protein source. And that is going to be derived from what we call the green stuff. So in our compost bin, when we are specifically making a compost bin for compost material to be organic matter to be used on our garden or, or whatnot, um, we want it to be as efficient as possible. There's gonna be different ways with your composting that can take a long time, or we can make it a little bit, take a little less time, um, depending on your setup, depending on your situation and what you need and what you want. Um, so if we provide the right food, that's gonna start us off in the right direction. So this is providing the right food for those microorganisms. So we want a 25 to one ratio of the good, the brown stuff and the green stuff. So the brown stuff is things like dried grass, dried leaves, newspaper. Um, we're going to want higher amounts of those because they are high in carbon. And then we need a little bit of green stuff. And those are going to be high in nitrogen. Um, vegetable and fruit waste, so like fruit peelings and um, just vegetable scraps, fresh cut grass or fresh leaves, maybe you've pruned on a shrub. Um, so it's not, it's not dry leaves yet, but it's fresh. Something like that going in is gonna be considered the green stuff. So to be the most efficient with our compost pile, 
we would do the 25 to 30 parts brown to one part of green. Now, when I've had compost piles in the past, this has not really been my ratio that I used. It was almost 100% brown um, just because that was the type of products that I was putting in the compost pile. The more green you have, it's going to, or the more close to this ratio you have, it's just going to work a little bit quicker to decompose and to become a compost product that you can actually use. Just going to make it a little bit quicker if you follow this, this ratio. So what I'm talking about then, the carbon to nitrogen ratio, 25 parts brown to one part green. Um, it's the amount of carbon and nitrogen in the materials that are added into that compost pile. So the brown is going to contain uh, more carbon. Um, and if too much brown material is used, then it's going to decompose a little bit slower. And in order to balance that out, if you see that it's kind of going a little slow, you can add a little bit more green. I hope that makes sense. Again, nobody's going to come out and, you know, measure your ratio, but, and it's kind of dependent upon your situation and what you're wanting to use the compost for, um, how big of a hurry you are in order for it to be decomposed, or if you're just good with it sitting there and taking some time, um, just that way it was stuff not going to the landfill. So it's, it's up to you um, and as far as how fast or slow you care about your compost. I never worried about it happening too fast. It was just stuff that I didn't have to take to the dumpster. So, okay, so we have a compost pile. Um, now we need to know what to include in it. So, and we'll talk about structures, different compost pile options um, toward the end of the presentation. But as far as what we're going to put in it, we want to have the green stuff. So, fresh leaves and like here in the picture, this is, you know, a shrub that has been pruned. So they're not dead yet. They're not brown yet, but they're fresh. That's going to be your green material. Um, plant cuttings, grass clippings. If you collect your grass clippings, um, a lot of people do not. It's actually pretty healthy for your grass to, to stay, um, to, to not collect your, your turf. And then that way it, it breaks down on its own and can improve your yard. However, if you've had to cut and we've had, we've had times where we've had a lot of rain here lately and your grass is super tall and we don't want that dead grass that's super tall dead grass laying on our lawn um, then collecting grass clippings in that sense might or in that opportunity might be a good opportunity to collect grass clippings in that situation and that would be a green item that you can add to your compost pile. Um, fruit and vegetable peels and other fruit waste can go into the compost pile and are going to be green. Um, coffee grounds and tea bags can also go into the compost pile and they are considered a green. In a moment, we're going to talk about some stuff that you can't, that you should not put in your compost pile. So we want green stuff, we want brown stuff, and there's going to be a list of stuff we don't want at all. So these are just some examples for the green. So what to include in the compost pile for your brown stuff, um, and this is the carbohydrates, um, is dead, dead weeds. Now, really important if you're putting, if you're pulling weeds in your garden um, or your landscape and you go throw those in the compost bin, that is perfectly fine. Just make sure that they do not have the seed head already established on there because what happens is they go in that compost pile over time that seed head is going to, or the seeds are going to um, germinate. And then you're gonna end up with weed seeds in your compost pile and wherever you spread that compost. So we do not want that at all. So if you have any type of weeds that you're putting in, whether they're dying or freshly green, whatever it may be, we wanna make sure that the seed head is not going in the compost pile. You will regret that big time. <laughs> um, dry leaves. So again, they're not the green leaves, but they're dry leaves like that we rake up in the fall. It's a perfect opportunity to, to put those in. Um, any type of clipped brush, you know, when you're, when you're pruning things, wood ash will work. We don't want tons of that, but some is okay. Excuse me, eggshells can go in. Sawdust, and I say that sparingly, um, sawdust, whenever it gets wet, and it's gonna happen um, because we're gonna need moisture in that compost bin. It's gonna to pack together and clump and it's just, it's not gonna be very useful for you. So if you have a little bit of sawdust, that's okay, but we don't want a whole lot of that thrown in there, um, kind of like the ash. 
Um, wood chips are perfectly fine um, and straw you can use as well. Just be mindful if there's any weed seeds within that straw as well. Okay, so those were the green, the green stuff, which we want one part of, and the brown stuff, which we need 25 parts of to get our perfect ratio in a perfect world. Um, but then there's also some things that we do not need to include in a compost pile. Here's a list. This is not in inclusive. There, there's other things that could fit into these categories as well that we do not want to include. Things like meat. Um, so like let if you've got, you know, leftover steak that you you cut off the fat while you're eating or whatever we don't want to put that into the compost pile we don't want bones dairy products salad dressings oils um, all of those things like that that were food items for one they as they decompose they are going to smell very badly very very badly think if you had um, spoiled milk or um, if you've you can just imagine decomposing meat. We don't want those things in our compost bin in our backyard. It's going to smell terribly. Also, it can bring um, or be a draw for animals that you do not want in your yard. So raccoons and things like that. We don't want to draw those in. Um, our compost bin should smell more like dirt, okay? Not, not like decomposing food. We don't want those things. So do not include those in your compost pile. Those things just need to go in the trash and just go to um, the landfill. I mean, that's just that's just how it is. So, because we don't want that in our backyard. Diseased plant material. So we talked a lot about plant material that can go into your compost bin. But if you have had any type of disease on that plant, so let's say that your tomato plants, you're at the end of the season and you're pulling those out and you're like, I'm just gonna put these in the compost pile. That's fine. But if they have had any type of disease, I would just toss those in the regular trash um, or put them in, you know, your fire pit to burn or something like that, because the disease can actually overwinter, depending on what it is, it can overwinter into that, um, in that pile. And then when your compost is ready to be used, and then you go and spread it on the garden, there's potential that that disease could still be present um, and then could spread onto the plants in your garden that you go on to plant. So, so we want to keep the disease material out. Um, weeds is the same way. And I, earlier I mentioned weed seeds, um, just because if we're using it for our garden or something like that, we, um, we don't want those weeds growing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, a lot of times a compost bin doesn't get hot enough, and we'll talk about that, but um, it doesn't get hot enough to kill off those diseases or to kill off those weed seeds to make them not germinate. So that's if we just avoid putting them in there. Um, pet waste and kitty litter, we also do not want to put in. Um, for one, if we're going to be putting this on our garden, we don't want that type of material that to be to be used on our garden. So um, and then, of course, you also have the smell associated with it. So so we do not want to include those things. So in order for a compost bin to be productive and to decompose your materials that you're putting in there, we're gonna need oxygen, moisture, and the correct temperature. So oxygen is needed for the aerobic decomposition. So those little microorganisms that I talked about, they need oxygen to live. So we need oxygen um, within that pile. Um, also, the more oxygen there is generated in there, it's not going to smell as badly. Um, and one way we can help with this is to turn the pile, which we will be talking about. But we're just going to be throwing stuff in our compost bin, and that is all well and good. But at times, we will need to turn that, okay? Um, and that's going to be to make, it's going to help with a couple of things. It's gonna mix everything up to help with the decomposition process. Um, and it's also gonna add oxygen. It's kind of like if a fan is blowing on you, it's creating some airflow. So if we're mixing all of that stuff up, then that is gonna be creating some airflow within that pile of compost. Um, moisture is needed for those little microbes to be working inside there. Um, and if it's, you know, if your bin is outside and if it's open, there's going to be some bins that are barrels and enclosed. If that's the case, you're going to have to open that lid and put some water in there on occasion. If it's outside, a lot of times your moisture level 
um, is going to stay fine just because we're going to get some rain. Um, but if we're going through a, a dry period, um, then you might need to just get the water hose and just kind of spray it down a little bit and then turn the pile a little bit. Um, but a lot of times nature kind of takes care of the moisture level for us. Um, and we don't always have to participate in that. Okay. Um, a correct temperature, optimum temperature, this is a really wide range, but optimum temperature for a compost bin um, is said to be 90 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Not expecting you to get out there with any type of uh, thermometer reading tool uh, to determine that. Usually, again, nature will take care of this, but the hotter it is, the faster the decomposition is going to happen. So for example, if you've got your compost pile outside and in the fall and winter, whenever it starts to get cooler, there's, there's just not a lot happening of the decomposition process. Um, it's sitting there, the microbes are still there, they're still alive, um, but it, they're not working as, as feverishly. So whenever it's hotter um, in the summer, you're definitely gonna be De decomposing faster. Um, <clears throat> the hotter the temperature can help kill those weed seeds, like I mentioned, but we're going to try to prevent putting weed seeds in there to begin with. Um, and as I said, it's faster microbial breakdown, just the hotter the temperature. So whenever we're thinking about preparing a compost bin, um, we need to think about the location. So we wanna choose an area that's convenient to the garden, if that's your preference for what's mostly gonna be going in there. If you're gonna be using kitchen scraps, um, just think about the location and kind of the handiness of it. If it's super far away, you're probably in just not as convenient to get to. You're probably not going to be as apt to use it as often. So the more convenient is located then, um, it's probably gonna be used more often and, and be more beneficial that way. You can have one compost pile or many. It's gonna be whatever works for your situation. That's a personal preference. And we'll talk about those options in a moment. Make sure that it is accessible from most sides easier for, cause that's gonna be easier for turning. Um, if you can see in this picture right here that like this is just some wood, um, slats and then there is a hinge I believe here um, maybe that's just holding it together sometimes there's a hinge and you can so it can be four-sided to where it encloses everything um, but there can be like a little gate that can open that up and it's going to be easier to to get in there and shovel it out whenever it's ready or to take a pitchfork and be and be turning it um, we want to protect it from wind and excessive sun the reason for that is if we have a lot of wind or if it is straight on sun and no shade, then um, it can dry out the pile. And I mentioned moisture is needed for those microbes to work. So that's gonna make us have to make sure that we check the water level more often and we might have to put water in it. Um, we might have to spray it down a little bit more often. So um, just think about that when you're thinking about a location. For faster composting, so if you want it to go as quickly as possible, um, your material should be shredded or in small pieces, which makes sense. The smaller the, the piece is, it's gonna break down quicker than large chunks. If you don't really care, um, then the, they can be larger pieces. It's just gonna take longer to, to break down. Um, so it'll still break down and just might take a little bit longer. And for me personally, that's fine. Um, but if you're more on a, a timetable, then um, think about making sure that those pieces that you, everything that you add is, is a little bit smaller in size so that it can move a little bit quicker. Um, so to reach um, temperatures that are higher, um, around 140 to 160 degrees. Remember we said like 140 is optimal. Um, just kind of a rule of thumb, the pile should be three feet tall, three feet wide and three feet deep. Um, and that's just gonna help you reach that. And the reason why is smaller piles than that, where, they, where they're smaller, um, they're not gonna be able to stay as warm during the fall and winter when those outdoor temperatures are so cold. Um, whereas a larger pile, is going to restrict your air movement from the center of the pile. So the outside edges of your pile might do just fine, but you might not be really getting that activity that you need on the inside as far as that air movement, because without the air movement, 
without the oxygen, those microbes just are not going to work. Um, they won't survive without the, the higher oxygen levels. Um, as we go throughout this presentation, you'll see different pictures that I'm throwing in. So, and we'll talk about this, but this one on the left is um, a compost barrel. So it was manufactured. Um, a lot of your compost bins are going to be homemade, perfectly fine. And we'll talk kind of about the pros and cons of each of those. So whenever your compost pile is kind of working, okay, it should be moist like a damp rag. I don't know how well you can see this picture is kind of blurry on the side, but that is wet, <laughs> okay, um, and maybe a little too wet. So we want it to be damp, but not soaking wet. Now, obviously, if it rains, we can't always avoid that. Um, but if we are watering ourselves, if we are monitoring how much if we need to add water or something like that, we want it to be damp, but not wet. If it's too wet, that can um, take out some of the oxygen that is going to be needed for the fermentation process and the decomposition process. And again, we need that oxygen in there. Um, if we have excessive rain, which we have had lately, um, not this week, but previous weeks, you can actually, you can do a couple of different things. Some people will put a tarp over um, the, the pile whenever they know that it's going to rain a lot. Um, and that's okay. Just make sure you remember to remove it because if that tarp stays on there, it's going to get super hot underneath and those microbes are going to die. Um, and so we're not getting the oxygen, we're not getting that airflow that needs to happen underneath there. So if you if it's very temporary and you just know that like this has already been rained on three days in a row, it doesn't need any more, I'm going to put a tarp on, that's fine. Just make sure you go ahead and remove it fairly quickly afterwards um, to get that oxygen happening again. Um, there are things called a compost blanket that you can purchase. So it's going to be like a woven material. So it's going to provide kind of like a shirt. Okay. It's going to provide coverage, but also allow for airflow. So, which a tarp does not provide. So it only provides the coverage. So if you live in an area that is, you know, or outside of Kentucky. If you, I'm just thinking in the Northwest, you would probably need this because it, it rains a lot there. But in the, the, the rainy seasons that we sometimes have in the spring, um, a compost blanket, if you're pretty into the composting, that might be a purchase worth making. Okay, so whenever we're actually making our compost, um, we want to do a layering method. And we're going to alternate those materials in theory, ideally, um, between the green and the brown, um, we're going to alternate those to be the most, so your compost bin is as efficient as possible. And I put on here, ideally, this is what's going to happen. I've had compost bins. I've never done the ideally part. Um, but this is what is recommended, you know, through research that is going to work the best and be the most efficient. So, as you are putting things in your compost bin, um, six inch layer of brown material, and then a two inch layer of green, and then a two inch layer of soil or organic matter. So maybe you've had some, um, some annuals that you planted in pots on your front porch, but you've got the, the, um, the potting soil that's still in the containers where you, where you purchased those and you didn't need all of that. Throw that in the compost bin. That's gonna be like your soil and organic matter that you can add to it. Um, this is in a perfect world, okay? Um, some of the research that I did said that in order to make this the most, I guess the most efficient or the to, to use your things wisely, <laughs> um, then you could um, have like a, a small bin with just green and a small bin with just brown, and then you can pull from those bins to do your layering. OK, um, depends on how much time you want to put into it, how much effort you want to put into it. Um, it's all going to be personal preference. Um, but the layering of the browns and greens can help um, because that way everything is working together. And then that's just that's the recommended uh, strategy there. So as we are going through the composting, 
process. We're gonna continue to check the moisture level. Um, remember that we want it to be damp, so not wet, but damp. Um, try squeezing the material at several different depths. So this picture is, is pretty, um, it's, a, it's a low compost pile, it's not real full, but you can, you can check different depths. On the top, it's probably gonna be more dry. Um, unless it's just rained. And then as you go deeper into the soil, just like if you were checking um, a, a potted plant on your porch that needed to, you know, doesn't need to water, we don't just want to look at the top surface. We want to go a little bit deeper into the soil and see, you know, is this actually dry or is this still got some moisture at the roots and, um, and we don't need to water it. So check different, different depths. Um, if your compost pile, if you find that it is drying out and something like, you know, this week that we've had where it has been dry um, and our temperatures are heating back up, there's a good chance that it could be drying out and it might need to have a little bit of water. Um, so we can take the hose and just kind of spray it down. And then we're going to turn it. And I mentioned a pitchfork earlier, literally like moving around um, and kind of mixing all of that compost together to, to make sure that that water reaches all of those components. A typical compost pile takes three to four months to fully decompose, but this is gonna vary, okay? It's gonna vary on the size, it's gonna vary on the location, it's gonna vary on the weather we've had, it's gonna vary on what amounts of every of the brown stuff and the green stuff that you're adding. Um, but if you follow like, you know, the I'm using quotes here, the, the rules that we've talked about today between three to four months to completely decompose. Mine have taken longer than that because I didn't necessarily do the, the ratio that I mentioned earlier, and that's perfectly fine. I didn't care if it took longer. So I've mentioned turning the compost two or three times. Um, what And in this picture, you can see it's literally a compost pile and someone with pitchfork, and that's what's recommended. Um, pitchfork or rake or shovel or anything like that will work. Um, it incorporates the uncomposted material to the outside of the pile or from the outside of the pile to the center where the microbes are. Your microbes are going to be more in the center of the pile. Um, and so we don't, if those microbes are working on the same particles over and over again, then they're they're done, okay? Um, so we want to move what's from the outside to the inside and what's done in the inside to the outside. So we're just kind of stirring that up um, so make sure that the microbes have something to work on. Stirring it up also is gonna create airspace between those particles um, and that airspace is gonna have that oxygen that's needed for the microbes. Um, stirring it up can also eliminate unpleasant odors. Sometimes even if we're putting the, the things that are recommended um, into the pile, sometimes we can still get unpleasant odors if it's just sitting there stagnant. So stirring that up and um, again, getting it to those microbes so they can start working is gonna help with those odors. So you've been, you know, putting things in your compost pile and now you've, you know, you've been checking the moisture and you've been turning the pile and all of that. So you got to figure out when it's done, when it's ready to use. So if it's been mixed well, um, it's been working for three or four months, then you think I might be getting close. So some things to look for. It should no longer be hot in the center. So if you have your hand in, or if you dig some out of the center and you feel that literally it's hot to the touch, okay? Things are still working. Um, when it's hot like that, that's a sign that those microbes are working, um, which is great, but we want everything to have died down and to be cooled off. And that's how we know it's ready to use is if it's cooled down. Um, if it's still hot in that center, then those microbes are still working and we need to sit it, let it sit for a little longer. It should look dark brown. It should basically look like a potty mix that you would purchase from the store. Um, it should crumble when squeezed, so not clump together, but crumble just like a perfect potty mix would. Um, and it should smell like fresh dirt, okay? Um, so that's how we're gonna know that it is ready to use. If you are unsure, I would let it sit a little bit longer. Um, and just so that it's going to be the most beneficial because once it is removed from that compost bin, it's nature. It's going to continue to break down, but you're not going to have the perfect environment for it to break down like you did in that bin where we had all those microbes working and, you know, we're kind of providing a good environment for that to happen. 
So once it's ready, um, as far as how to use the compost, um, areas planted every year, like a garden, you can that can accept frequent applications of compost. So you know each year or in the spring, and again, in, in, you know if you want to do in the fall, if your fall crops, um, that's perfectly fine. Um, and when you're adding it to the garden, just a little side note here is mix one to two inches of compost with the top six to eight inches of topsoil. So if you're tilling your garden, we want to spread that compost and then till it. Okay. We don't just want a top layer of compost. We want to incorporate that into our existing soil because we want to improve our existing soil and the compost provides that good organic matter. So we want to mix that together. If you're in a smaller area, you don't have a tiller, that's just, you still want to incorporate, you're just gonna to need to do it with a hoe or um, a metal rake or something like that, just to make sure you're mixing it. We just don't want a, a top layer. That's that's not the, the purpose of the compost. Um, compost can be used in container plants. So if you've got vegetables that are growing in containers or flowers are growing in containers, it is comparable to um, peat moss, and um, so it can be used, but you want to make sure that you include something like perlite um, to involve, or excuse me, to avoid water logging. So it does have a tendency, the compost is going to hold water, which is great, but in a container, that can be a problem. So we need to make sure we add a component like perlite so that we do have some drainage quality in that mixture as well. Okay, so now we're moving on to um, some different types of compost piles. So this is the easiest option, um, just a standalone pile. And for aesthetic purposes, this might not be what you prefer, um, but depending on where you live, um, it's totally not a problem, okay? Um, but a standalone pile is definitely easy. You don't have to worry about, you know, turning it and whatnot because you have access on all sides. Uh, minimal investment because you're literally just making a pile. Um, three months to one year for the finished product. So it's going to move a little bit quicker. And the reason why is because it is, it is open, okay? Um, but again, three to four months is usually what we're looking at. Um, this can take up to a year. For one reason, it is open, but the downside of that is whenever we have a little bit more closed space, we can create that heat a little bit better um, and give those microbes a good opportunity to work. This is gonna cool down a whole lot quicker unless you have it in straight sun. A picket fence or something similar to that. Um, you would need four posts to make your square and then fencing, of course. This is going to be sturdy. Um, it is going to be kind of decorative. Um, so again, personal preference on that. Um, the bad thing is, is it can't be moved. It's going to be, it's going to be pretty stationary um, until you remove those, um, you remove the compost and you would have to dig up the post and whatnot. So it's going to be stationary but it does somewhat hide the contents. So if you have something in your backyard and you don't really want just an open pile um, or you want something to look a little bit more decorative, a picket fence um, with those open slats in between, create good airflow, um, but yet still hides those contents. So that's, that's a good option for some people. A barrel, in one of the pictures earlier, I showed you a barrel, which does, that was on EKU campus. Um, and the barrel does contain the contents it, it, and it hides the contents. So it looks more like a trash can. So in places like that at EKU where it's beside a sidewalk, um, then that is a good option rather than a compost pile. Um, you do have to watch it more carefully because it is going to dry out a lot quicker. Um, and it's probably not going to get quite as much airflow. So we're going to need to turn it more frequently. Um, and watch more carefully to see if we need to add water. But it is very neat, it is very tidy, um, but in comparison to a three foot by three foot by three foot um, box <laughs> for our backyard pile to a barrel, it's not gonna hold as much, but that might be all that you need. Again, it depends on your, your situation. A cinder block bin, I've seen this, I've not used it myself, but this is a really good option. 
Um, it's very durable. It's easy to build. The blocks are, of course, heavy to handle, but a lot of times people have blocks and they want to get rid of them. I mean, they will give them to you if you come pick them up. Um, so they can potentially be free. Um, a lot of farms, for some reason, just have these sitting around. <laughs> I don't really know why, but, um, but sometimes you can get them for free and you can build it to whatever size you wanted. Um, it doesn't have great air circulation just because those blocks are solid. They're not slatted like the picket fence that we looked at. Um, but you still have, if you're willing to turn it, then that's still going to be fine for your airflow. Um, a sturdy backstop for turning and shoveling. So like the open pile, you're going to, you have a tendency to make a big mess. This is going to kind of keep everything contained. Um, can be stacked as multiple bins. And we'll talk about multiple bins in a moment. But if you wanted um, more than one bin, you know, you can easily add and um, add on a little bit of space for those blocks. And they, like I say, they can be whatever size you want them to be. Wood pallets, this is what I have used in the past, um, is just taking some spare pallets and put some, some T-post in, um, like is shown here in the picture, and build up just a little, a little three-sided box, and it works really well. And a lot of times you can get pallets for free as well, or you might have some laying around where you've had some type of shipment. Um, or businesses might be willing for, you know, to give them to you. So pallets are a really good option, kind of like the picket fence that we talked about. This is just a more rustic approach, um, but they have the slats in there, which is great for airflow because you're getting air in from, you know, all sides um, whenever it rains or whenever you need to water it, then you've got a lot of open areas that the water can get to. Um, and it does keep it contained so you can, you know, mix, mix in those um, whenever you go to turn it. Um, it's somewhat permanent, but easier to move than like the cinder blocks um, can be used, like I said, out of recycled materials, inexpensive, potentially free, um, depending on what resources you have to get those products. Um, and in this one, on another picture I mentioned, uh, or on another slide, maybe multiple bins. and depending on your situation, this might be an option. So if you see to the left, they've got a lot of brown, okay? And then to the right is, of course, a lot of green. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what this person is doing, but they might be doing the layering approach with this brown is broken down, so now I'm going to add some of that green and then and kind of layer it that way. Or um, in some cases, it might be box you know, the left box is going to be done quicker than the right-handed box. So I'm going to have kind of it in steps. I'm going to have this, the left box is going to be ready. And then, you know, the following year, I'm going to use the one on the right and just kind of rotating back and forth. That's going to be your own system. However you choose to do that um, is, is up to you, but that does work pretty well. And then another type of material is just a manufactured bin that is specifically for composting. Um, similar to the barrel that we saw earlier, um, but this is even more specific. I don't know how well you can tell, but these are made for composting. This is actually, I've used one like this before. Doesn't hold a lot, but it works really quick. Um, so this is, hopefully you can see my pointer. This is a lid that just kind of screws on and off. And hopefully you can see it, but there's this barrel is sitting in this little tray, okay? And you just rotate it. You literally just um, spin it on itself. Um, and you put some, open up the lid, put in your compost materials, put in your, um, spray in some water and then rotate it. And um, I've used one of these before. And like I said, it's doesn't hold a lot, but it is very, very, very quick as far as the decomposition process. The downside is I've never used one like this up at the top, but it looks like it would be a little bit more user friendly as far as weight, because this guy down here at the bottom gets a very heavy. So even just spinning it on this track, it can, it can get very heavy. And then whenever you go to dump it, um, you might need some help with that because it's, it's going to be difficult to lift. Um, so it can get very heavy where it looks like this is more, might be easier to spin. Um, and then we can 
sit something underneath here to dump out, you know, into a wheelbarrow or whatever, where that's not an option with this one, but it does work very fast. And then um, this is the last picture that I'll show you with different units, but this is a most fancy as you can get, <laughs> okay? Um, and it can be as simple or as complex as you want your system to be. Um, this one is a little more complex, but it, it's, it's very neat if you have the, the option and you know the want to do this. So here we've got three different um, categories. We've got food and yard waste that's going in here. We've got compost that is actively curing. And then here we've got compost that's ready to use. And these could be alternated. So when you've got ready to use, you know, then after it has been used, then maybe you switch, you know, your food and yard waste. You could, you could rotate these around. Um, and this setup also has barrels. Um, so they've got a very complex system here. I shouldn't say complex, but um, detail oriented system that if you um, wanted to use, that would be, that would be great. The only downside with this that I see, I think the pallets are awesome, but in order to, I don't know if I, I stole this picture from somewhere. I don't know if there's like a gate where this opens, um, but think about that if you're building something like this, because we don't want to have to climb onto these pallets to, to turn and to get the stuff out. So we need, a, we need a way to access that. And I'm not sure, I can't really tell from this picture um, how that is done. So whenever you're designing yours, um, if you want something like this, that's great, but just consider that. All right, pardon me. Okay, so on to the, um, the final segment of the presentation, and that is the troubleshooting, okay? So this does happen. My compost has a bad smell, what should I do? Um, so here's just, we're gonna go over a few different things like this that, that could come in handy if you've already got a compost pile or if you're thinking about it. Um, but if it has a rotten egg smell, so if that's the case, then there might not be enough air or there could be too much moisture. So the solution is to turn the pile and incorporate coarse browns. So not the little fine ones, but coarse browns. So dried leaves, sticks, little twigs, anything like that. And over time that will help with that situation. If there is an ammonia smell, then that means too much nitrogen or too much green stuff. So to offset that, we can incorporate some more of the brown stuff. If the pile is not heating up or it's decomposing very slowly, okay, so it's taking too long to decompose, what should I do? As I mentioned before, the size of that can depend, um, the location can depend on how long it takes to decompose and what you put into it can take, can determine how long it takes to decompose. Um, and the hotter it is on the inside of that pile, then the faster decomposition is going to happen. So if the pile is too small, we can add more organic matter to that pile uh, to make the decomp happen a little bit quicker. If there's insufficient moisture, um, we can turn the pile and add water. Um, if there is, and again, so you would just check, you know, squeeze it and determine if it's damp like it's supposed to be. If there is a lack of, there could be a lack of nitrogen. Um, so maybe you have too much of the brown stuff and not enough of the green stuff, which is your nitrogen. So it could be that. So you can add um, more food waste um, and then the green grass clippings or the green leaves, just adding some more green. Um, taking too long to decompose, it might not have enough air. Those microbes might need some more oxygen so we can turn the pile. If the weather is cold, okay, um, we can increase the pile size because maybe it's too small and it can't hold the heat in. Um, or we can insulate with straw or a tarp. So you can put some straw in there and that's going to act as an insulation barrier. Um, you could put a tarp on. I mentioned not putting on a tarp or being mindful of a tarp in the summertime because it can get too hot. They can kill your microbes. Um, but in cold weather, if it's not working, um, as well as it needs to, then putting on a tarp can get it to the right temperature to be warm inside there, but not too hot. Rodents are getting into my compost. Um, so an option for that, you might have food waste that is exposed. 
So um, maybe there's food waste on top so we can bury that food waste, okay? Just so that it's not so obviously visible to the rodents. Um, and then if we might have put something in that wasn't supposed to go. So meats or baked goods or dairy products, anything with grease and oil, um, we're not supposed to add those to the bin. So maybe accidentally we did, and that could be the reason for the pest or the rodents. So that is the end of um, my presentation. Hopefully that answered some of your questions today. Um, and Ray, if you are here with us, we'll, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and um, we'll check out questions that we've got. It looks like so far, well, we have a um, comment, first of all, from um, Brittany Woodward from over in Franklin County, looks like solid waste coordinator is just kind of giving a shout out to those folks that may be on from Franklin County about the backyard composting program. So you may want to direct your attention, those of you that are in Franklin County to the comments in the chat box, uh, cause Brittany's put some info there. Um, we do have one question from Adam. Uh, uh, the question is, can you have too much water in a bin? The stuff in his composter is very wet at times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can definitely have too much water. Um, and when you have too much water, then your oxygen levels are going to be off. Um, so we want to either add more to the compost bin to help kind of soak up that extra water. Or if it's very soupy, you might even need to scoop out some water, depending on the situation, um, what, what type of compost bin you have. But yeah, too much water is a bad thing. I know that in uh, parts of the country that get a lot more rain than we do, it's interesting as I've traveled around until we started doing a lot of these uh, composting programs, all of us, I uh, didn't think about it, but now I kind of notice when I, particularly like the New England area, a lot of their compost bins have roofs on them. You'll notice oh. that they actually have uh, some kind of um, way to keep the rain out because they simply get too much rain and they get stinky compost basically when, when it goes anaerobic. And I guess that's why I never thought yeah. about it until I started paying attention that in wetter areas, they're just accustomed to having some way to prevent all the natural rain from getting in. And sometimes there's a hinge top to where if it gets dry, they let the rain in and then put the, just hinge the, the, the roof back over the bin. So yeah, I don't see that much in Kentucky, but I see it other parts of the country. So it's interesting. Right. And with all the rain we've had, Adam, I don't know if it's been more of an issue for you this year um, or consistently, but with the rain that we've had off and on, <laughs> if it was in a not very protected area and got a lot of rain, then that could explain um, it's wet as soup <laughs> as you <Yeah>. can. <laughs> so yeah, stir it um, and then add in more, um, just add in more stuff to be composted can, can try to help um, alleviate that issue. It looks like we do have another question. Do you recommend, Jessica, using aged manure as a soil component? If it is aged manure and already in the decomposition process, um, then yes, that is perfectly fine. Um, we never want to put um, fresh manure in um, and we want any manure that we use to have already been aged. Um, and again, if we're putting this on our garden, and Ray, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but there's a 120 day rule if you're using um, manure that it needs to have been decomposed. De it needs that word, be, yes. Yeah, <laughs> to be composted yeah, for yeah. 120 days before yeah. it can be used on your garden. For it's not decomposed, is it considered raw? Is that what it is, Jessica? Yeah. It's considered yeah. raw manure unless it's been through, what did you say, 120 days? 120 days. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, very interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's just from a food safety standpoint uh, yeah. for putting it on. Yes. Um, they tell us, Jessica, if any of you guys are market gardeners that are on the program today, uh, and you've not already done so, please reach out to your local office because there's some very specific guidelines for you, you guys that use manures and based on what type of crop, how low it grows to the ground, so on and so forth. Uh, there's different regulations concerning that and they're really easy to kind of grasp, but kind of reach out to your extension office if you're, if you fall into those categories of a market gardener, so. But yeah, uh, Julie, if it's aged manure, then that's perfectly fine to add in as a soil component. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and when I was, I was a teacher uh, prior to my work in extension, and so at the end of the season in our school greenhouse, we would have a lot of um, 
you know, plants that either plants that did not sell or um, just didn't make it or whatever, but we would, you know, throw out those plants and then we would have the, that soil that's left in that container. And that was a great thing to, to put into the compost pile. So if you have, um, I mentioned like the flowers on, you know, on your porch that are in planters, it's the end of the season, pull those dead plants out that, you know, were annuals and then just dump what you had left over of your potting mix into the compost pile. And that is a perfect, um, use for that rather than just going in the trash or um, a lot of times if we carry that over to the next year we can have some disease issues so if we throw that into the compost that's a really good um, component for the for that organic matter um, to add to the to your brown to green ratio hey i've got a question mm -hmm. are you there yes oh okay well, i really have a question as a comment um, I, I can't, I, I, I run a compost pile at the a Presbyterian church in Midway and it's got three bins and I have used it the way you're talking about. Uh, but, um, I have been solely in charge of it. And unfortunately I am called away of uh, sometimes weeks at a time and sometimes a month at a time. And I find that things get added to the compost pile, which I'm happy about. Uh, but the one thing I'm concerned about is that people uh, put in uh, green stuff like big cabbage leaves and things like that. And basically it shields the pile from air and from moisture. And um, I can't emphasize enough that people, if they put stuff on the pile, that at least to be in a reasonable size, and you can comment on that, is to make sure that air and water will flow well. Then at one point, I was gone for a sidal period in the fall, and it went through the winter, and leaves got piled into it and it looked kind of awesome. <laughs> uh, but unfortunately what happened when the leaves weren't turned, <laughs> they all kind of uh, glued themselves together. And what you had, it was instead of a compost pile, you had a pile of proto lignite. It was all black and it was wonderful, but it was just a solid mass. Yeah. So I can't emphasize enough that you, you turn the pile and that uh, what you put in there it, is, uh, it, it is, uh, has been shredded to a particular size. So that's all I've got to say at this point. I appreciate your, what you're doing. And uh, I've been following it uh, in, in detail, even though I was getting a haircut at the time. <laughs> Well, thank you for your comments. You are exactly right. Um, if and we mentioned that the the shredded, um, if your particles can be small and shredded, they're going to decompose. They're going to, oh my goodness, I can't get my words right today. They're going to decompose um, a whole lot faster. Um, and good point about it. Just if you have just a lot of full size leaves or the full size lettuce pieces um, that are not shredded, it can just create a layer that is not helpful. <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna keep out your your oxygen and your moisture. So if those things are put in that are full size, and I have done it, you know, put things in full size, but you've got to make sure that you are turning that pile very regularly if that is the case. So um, Putting in smaller pieces is going to be recommended. Um, if you do get some large pieces, it's definitely going to need to be turned more often um, to, to make your decomp happen. Yep, those are good. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I've got a fellow came along the other day and said, uh, you're, you're looking good. And I said, well, it's going to be great, but I need somebody to turn it. Mm -hmm. Well, he said, well, I'll do it. <laughs> I said, well, you don't know what you get yourself in for, but that's fine. Yeah. Uh, it, it's good. And, but especially in the fall, if you can get somebody to, to, to turn it and, and add the green stuff with the leaves, 
Yeah. Uh, right. uh, that and and continue to turn it even though that it's cold. Yes. Uh, it, it can you you can end up. I mean, it's been almost two years, and those leaves, I they still won't break down. Mm -hmm. uh, they are they are welded together in some wonderful organic matter, which I don't appreciate at this point. And so it has to be turned. Yeah. Yeah. And shredded if all possible. Right, right. If you if you get a neighbor that has a lawnmower that will, you know, go over the leaves and chop them up uh, and bag it and then put, yeah, that would be wonderful. Right. Uh, anyway, uh, it's it, everybody else in the it's a community garden and and I want to come take a look at it. It's really wonderful, but you know. Everybody wants to do planting and to some extent weeding, uh, but nobody's really interested in composting <laughs> and it got out of control. So yeah, yeah, anybody that does composting has, has got to have a, a, a real good character. I mean, a character that is persistent mm -hmm. and doesn't give up easily. Yep. Yeah, and so for the, if anyone on here is not... Um, you know, if, if you're just thinking about doing composting, I do encourage you to start small. Um, that's what we say with everything. If you've never gardened before and you want to garden, start small um, because there is some work involved in it. Um, and if you're just doing small um, amounts of composting, you might want to try those those uh, barrels that you can purchase. Um, and it's, it's just going to be dependent on what your need is and what your want is and how much time um, and activity level you want to put into it. And everybody's can be different and um, some's going to de uh, decompose faster than others, depending on your setup and all of that is, is well and good. So um Ray, I don't have any more questions in the chat box on my end. Do you? No, I don't see any more. Okay. Well, I got one more thing to say, and that okay. is I re really appreciate what you said about the ratio of green to brown, because mm -hmm. I had not, I had seen a lot of charts that said this is green and this is brown, but never came out and specified that. And the other thing that you said was the depth of the layers, the layers of green, mm -hmm. layers of brown, and the soil, the soil is necessary in order to get your microbes in there. Right. Right. I mean, I've, I've studied this up to a point, mm -hmm. but you have certainly added a lot of good information that I really okay. appreciate and will help me out a lot. Good, thank you. Well, um, if we don't have any more questions, um, we thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we're not sure yet what we're gonna do this fall. This is our last uh, session for this webinar series. Um, we're kind of going to see where the world stands at that point in time, I think, of uh, if we if we move forward or if we do something different. But um, I know speaking on behalf of um, Harrison and Bourbon and Franklin and Woodford, we really appreciate your all's attendance. And um, if you've not been able to attend some of the sessions, I, don't know, I said at the beginning, but in case you weren't on, those recordings can be found on our web pages, um, on the Extension web pages under the Horticulture tab on all four of our counties. So we invite you to go watch those as many times as you need. And if you ever have any questions, um, just reach out to your own Extension agent, depending on where you live or one of us, and we'll be happy to help. Thank you all.